Right. And I have seen uh, a lot of people talking about that cradle boarding or intentional uh, warping of a child's soft, malleable skull. But there are several examples that clearly wouldn't fit into the category of being manipulated, right? It seems like it's natural to a degree in some minority of cases. Yeah, 100% of the academics state quite emphatically that all examples of elongated skulls are the result of cranial deformation. But we've found examples here in the Paracas area where there are skulls which are quite a bit larger than normal in terms of cranial volume. And there are other physical characteristics which make them different from what we call homo sapiens sapiens. Hmm. And as far as people doing it intentionally or cultures doing it intentionally, their motivations apparently are kind of interesting, right? Yeah. The basic consensus is when descendants of, of these people have been able to be asked, why did your ancestors do this? They would say, it makes our children more intelligent. We find it aesthetically pleasing. And that is what the ancestors looked like. <laughs> that last point is definitely a head scratcher. But as a general conspiracy guy, I'm always interested in questions dealing with the elite and power and bloodlines of today or any era. And there's definitely an element of that in what we know about these skulls, right? That it had to do with the uh, upper echelons of society. Yeah, almost exclusively, whether it was in Europe or Western Asia, the Middle East, Melanesia, even Australia, and various other local, all through uh, Central and parts of South America, it's almost exclusively just the nobility whose heads were shaped that way in order so that the general public could easily identify who their rulers were. Hmm. <laughs> Provocative stuff. And so what other characteristics? You mentioned some certain features in the uh, more natural elongated skulls that might be worth noting. Surprisingly, a lot of them are mummified and seemingly quite well preserved, right? Yeah, it's astonishing. The area where I'm at, which is Paracas in Peru, is the northern part of the Atacama Desert. So we get about half, half an inch of rainfall a year, and it's all desert in this area. It's uplifted ancient ocean. So the sand contains salt, and so that combination of dryness and salt has been remarkable at preserving these ancient people, even better than in Egypt. Mm. Wow. So I guess some of that is environmental rather than through a advanced preservation practice? Yeah. In this area, they don't seem to have had a really advanced mummification process like in Egypt, like with wrapping and different oils and waxes and things like that, that being used. It's simply that the ground is so dry that they've been able to excavate and pull out textiles 2,000 years old that look like they were made maybe five or 10 years ago. Hmm. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. So these naturally elongated skulls, a couple other things about them, uh, larger eye sockets apparently, and where the spine connects to the skull is a little different than typical homo sapien sapien if i understand correctly yeah it's an ongoing process that we're doing we're trying to get as many medical professionals involved as possible to look at the anomalies and as you stated the eye sockets are larger than normal they tend to be more vertical and larger also where the spinal cord and vertebrae enter the skull underneath the position of what's called the foramen magnum, which is the hole in the bottom of the skull, is much farther back than normal. So that would probably be an evolutionary thing in order to be able to balance these cone-headed skulls. Also, there tends to be one suture line on top of the skull, which is missing. And then there are two holes in the back of the skull, which seem to be for blood and nerve flow. Yeah, those two holes, I, I just thought that was... So interesting. And the, I guess the cranial stitching that's missing, what do you think that would indicate? That's pretty curious. It's very curious. And any physician who's seen these in, in person with me, they say that, you know, there's supposed to be a suture line there. And I don't understand why it's not there. That's, uh, that's the most interesting thing about having medical professionals, because they know very well the shape and design of the human skeleton. And when they see anomalies like this, they simply shake their heads because it's not in any of their textbooks. Hmm. 
Man, so do we know much about the Paracas culture outside of that they had some interesting skulls? Well, it's actually one of the least research cultures in all of Peru. The famous Inca have been studied for hundreds of years by many different academics, but the Paracas haven't been studied at all since about the 1960s. And you would think the elongated skull by itself would create a lot of curiosity and study. Another anomaly is the fact that they had genetically red hair, which is thinner than normal Native American hair and, and is also wavy. Hair experts who have studied the hair say that it's much more Caucasian than Native American. Hmm. Right. I noted that for sure, that the reddish brown hair seems to be one of the main elements of interest. What more can we gather from that trait? Well, when you, when you trace back where red hair originates, it is from the Middle East. So the, the Celtic people, like the Scots and the Irish, who are famous for bright red hair, are likely descended from Middle Eastern ancestors. And the hair that we're looking at is actually more auburn. It's a, it's a very fiery red-brown, and that's typical of certain parts of the Middle East up until this day. There were a couple of quotes in uh, a few of your books where I felt like people were equating this also to some areas of Europe or Nordic descent, which I thought was Nordic. I thought was a little strange for red hair. Um, actually, well, actually, no. If you look at the migration patterns into Western Europe, there were people with red hair whose ancestors thousands of years ago moved into areas such as Scandinavia through Russia. And actually, Russia means the land of the red hair. <laughs> so huh. so that's, that's the migration pattern, mainly from, it seems the origin seems to be somewhere around the Caucasus, the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea. Hmm. That's very interesting. And like you mentioned, the Paracas culture, one of the least researched cultures, but is there any insights we can get from the Incas or any of the other surrounding cultures of their day where they talked about at all? Well, the Paracas disappeared about 2,000 years ago, and the Inca rose about 1,000 years ago. But mm. one of the connections I'm starting to develop is that the earliest Spanish chronicles talk about them seeing people with red hair and blonde hair in Cusco, which really shocked them because they, they literally wrote in their accounts, these people have lighter skin than we do. So because red hair is directly associated with very light skin, it's quite possible that the Paracas, when they were being exterminated about 2,000 years ago, that some of them were able to escape on an ancient trail or road eastward into the highlands of Peru and wound up as partial ancestors of the Inca who came later. Hmm. Right on. So there's also stories in North America of giants. I don't hear elongated skulls associated quite so often, but I do hear red hair associated fairly often. And there's some apparently legends from Native American tribes that they used to do battle with redheaded giants. I don't know how much stock you put in some of those stories. I guess they have varying degrees of credibility, but have you looked at that angle at all? Yeah, actually, I've been a student of Native American studies since I was about 10 years old. And I, I put a lot of credence in their oral tradition. So there are numerous Native people of the past or tribal groups who speak about, you know, I don't know if giant is the correct term, but very tall people who were there when the Native people arrived. And they did do battle with them and eventually wiped them out. Yeah, and there are a lot of stories around the world, uh, oral traditions that do talk about visits from fair-skinned people, apparently, and also red hair is mentioned a decent amount. But how often is an elongated skull highlighted in these stories? Because you think if they had that characteristic, that would be the top of the description chart. Yeah, you would think so. I actually wrote a book called The Plume Serpent, which is about Native American, Native South American stories of ancient teachers who arrived in the distant past who had full beards, light-colored hair, and light-colored skin. 
One term used is the Viracochans, another is Quetzalcoatl, another is Kukulkan. And these were ancient teachers that arrived and instructed the people, supposedly coming from some distant eastern land. Right, and that's really interesting because Quetzalcoatl, you know, in, in mainstream culture often talked about as a, a deity, a, a feathered serpent. And I guess your contention is that that was actually based on a real teacher, or is this still allegory? No, I think it's based on real teachers. One of the problems with interpreting native oral tradition is that it tends to be quite poetic. It's not like point-to-point -point facts. So they tend to flower, especially over the course of time, they, they flower the original story. But I think the origin is likely based on, on truth because we're learning more and more that the migration of people around the world was much more extensive than what we've been taught in history books. Right. And there does seem to be a, a curious connection between reptiles and teachers or elevators of mankind when it comes to a lot of these indigenous tribes. You could even draw a parallel to the serpent in the Garden of Eden. But what do you make of that tie-in? Well, I think a lot of it in recent times has been really overblown. If you look at the symbolism itself, again, because native oral tradition is, is quite poetic and, for example, with the Inca culture, they had three animals that were very important totems to them. One was the serpent, another was the, the puma, and the third was the condor. So those are also levels of consciousness. So the serpent represents the subconscious, the puma is the conscious, and the condor is the superconscious. And so if, if you put those three together in a very powerful teacher or person, I think that's where the, the term feathered serpent comes from. It's a combination of these three levels of consciousness. Mm. But people have tendency then, then to say, well, they were obviously, you know, two-legged reptiles that had feathers that walked around and, you know, and, and had to be alien. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, look at the griffin, and you got the whole trifecta there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you you find that in, in many parts of the world where you have, especially the serpent, because the serpent represented wisdom to so many different cultures, and then a bird would represent the connection with the divine because of the fact they can fly so high. Yeah, it's just so interesting and curious that so many cultures that apparently didn't communicate arrived at some of the same symbolism. Yeah, that could be a, a basic component of human consciousness, rather than it being taught, you know, from one side of the world to the other. It, it might be a very root understanding that we have as human beings. That's true. That's true. Can't discount that possibility. And the condor is kind of interesting because, of course, Graham Hancock, he is very adamant about this pillar at Gobekli Tepe having significance. And it, of course, has a kind of cartoonish condor on it. Yeah, that and also I think there are depictions of cats as well. Uh, you know, the feline or the cat is another great symbol that is international in terms of ancient oral tradition. Hmm. I love that stuff. And so to get back to the elongated skulls, apparently a lot of them are found around Tiwanaku and Pumapunku in Peru, which of course are a pair of the uh, many megalithic sites being talked about now. But what can you tell us about those sites that make them so interesting to you? Well, the interesting thing is because I've been traveling around in South America for years and have visited sites like Puma Punku and Tiwanaku, I've been there more than 50 times. Again, of course, I wrote a book, and the book is about the elongated skulls of Peru and Bolivia. And in general, wherever we find a megalithic site, if there is an on-site museum, we'll find evidence of elongated skulls having lived there. Hmm. And maybe you can help clarify something for me, but are these two separate sites or kind of the same site? What draws the distinction between the two? Because I think I understand them to be on the same plateau, right? Yeah, they're, they're right next door to each other. It's, it's kind of tiresome to have to say Tiwanaku and Pumapunku because they, historically they are the same location. It's just that when they decided to preserve them, they built one fence around one and one fence around another, and then a ticket window at one and a ticket window at the other. So one has a sign saying Tiwanaku, another has a sign saying Pumapunku. 
But when you look at the megalithic nature of the original construction, it's the same site. Mm -hmm. Okay. Makes a lot of sense. And it is located on this plateau that a lot of people talk about. If you've seen pictures, it's definitely a impressive view. Do you think that plateau is natural? Because some people suggest that it might have been uh, laid as the base for this Pumapunku complex. Yeah, it's got a really interesting history because the conventional story, which, you know, as usual, doesn't make any sense, <laughs> is that it, it was a Bronze Age culture called the Tiwanaku who constructed all of this. And some of the stonework would be very difficult to replicate today with modern high-tech power tools. So that you have to throw that story out immediately. So when you look farther back in time, the great researcher of that area was called Poznansky, and he was able to do measurements of the precession of the equinox, which measures the wobble of the Earth. And so by using that principle, you can measure how many degrees off a site is from perfect true north, south, east, and west. And he believed that Pumapunku and Tiwanaku were originally constructed about 15,000 years ago, which scholars throw out the window. But if you look at that time period, at least 12,000 years ago, Lake Titicaca was 100 feet higher than it is today. And so its shoreline would have been at Tiwanaku and Pumapunku. So it, it does seem like the site was built up in order to make sure that it was slightly higher than the lake level, and therefore it could have been a port of some kind. Interesting. And I guess with this date of 15,000 years old, would that put it more in line with the Paracas time period? Are you, are you uh, of the mindset that they had something to do with the building? Uh, no, because the Tiwanaku culture did have elongated skulls, but they basically are the result of cranial deformation. So they existed between 2,000 and 1,000 years ago. The conventional story of the Paracas, which is still an open book, is that they spontaneously arrived in this area about 800 BC and then disappeared about 100 AD. Oh, okay. So I wasn't quite sure how far back they went. I actually thought it was going to be a lot further back. 800 BC uh, is kind of a little surprising. Well, that's the that's the conventional timeline. We don't know yet. That's why we're planning on doing a lot of radiocarbon testing samples from the Paracas to see their exact age. And I'm still trying to research where their first location of habitation is. Mm, right. Interesting. So... Also, I wanted to ask you about, there's actually a long strip of land called the Path of Veracocha, where apparently a lot of interesting things are found, including the stuff we're talking about, right? Yeah, it's really interesting. It's, it's an energetic line. It's, it's part of the Earth's grid system of energy. It goes from more or less the north coast of Peru, where Peru meets Ecuador, down in a southeasterly direction, and along that line are almost all of the ancient megalithic sites, including Tiwanaku, the Island of the Sun, Machu Picchu, Cusco itself, and other locations. That brings in the kind of esoteric idea that these sites were used energetically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really am intrigued by that perspective. Uh, with my limited understanding, I don't necessarily know how they could be used, but what does your research show? What do you think some of the possibilities of how they could have used this grid would be? Well, again, the main thing we have to do is throw the conventional archaeological ideas out the window because these sites are clearly older than any known culture of the area. And, of course, we can get into Egypt as well, which is another area that is all about that. And so... The megalithic work had to have been done using forms of high technology, and in some cases, technology beyond our capability, which most people won't accept, but that is the fact, because we've taken many engineers and stonemasons to these locations, and when they see the precision of the stonework, they say, I don't know how I could do that. Hmm. And that's another interesting question I had for you, is some researchers talk about, because of utilization of something like a global energy grid, they they think that maybe there was a global culture. Do you think that's necessary, or do you think it could have been just like higher society than we typically think, kind of like today, but not necessarily one community? Well, I think there were at least three ancient 
highly evolved societies. I don't think there was one. And the reason why I think that is that the construction techniques that we see are quite different. The work in Peru and Bolivia tends to be very organic, very polygonal shaped stones that tightly fit together. When you go to Egypt, it's much more cubic and linear. And then Pumapunku and Tiwanaku are unique on the planet. There, there is no building technique that was used anywhere else except there. Right on. Yeah, ar architecture is usually what you got to look at because, you know, you can see the differences and in there lies some insight into who made them. But I've also heard some researchers talking about, like Richard Cassaro talks about the, the triptych, the idea that there is a three-doorway design found in architecture all over the planet. Maybe not at the time depths we're talking about, of course, but it's a curious thing, too, that suggests some kind of intermingling. Yeah, it's, it's quite possible, or uh, it's also possible that due to the energetic nature of these complexes, that either by using the energetic grid or, or by other means, there was communication between ancient civilizations that were quite far apart. Right. I think that's a, a fascinating possibility that they could be used for communication. Like, how could we visualize how that would work? Well, I think to kind of overdo it would be to say that they were like stargates. But mm. I think portal is much more useful term because we see these very strange depressions in stone walls, especially around the Cusco area, quite often the size of a refrigerator. So somebody can stand up inside this solid stone depression. Usually the stone contains quartz crystal, which of course is used in electronics in modern times. So it's, uh, it's quite possible that the stone was specifically selected for its energetic properties in order to be able to utilize the Earth's energy to amplify that energy and be able to direct it either through sound or possibly even vision or video of some kind. Mm, wow. Vision or video, I think, is pretty awesome. Uh, portals typically, I think, indicate travel. And I have seen those things you're talking about, those little stone doorways that are carved out of stone. And it just looks like, man, maybe there was a, an extra piece there at some point or, or something. But has there been very many anomalous type of uh, elements found around these areas that could maybe connect to some type of technology? Well, the, the interesting thing is that we're looking at a level of knowledge which is theoretical to us because they don't seem to have appeared to use technology as we see it. Like, you know, this computer that I'm looking at that's got buttons and, you know, a glass front and stuff like that. So that, that's what makes it very difficult to figure out, but it makes it very intriguing. And I think it's also the reason why standard academia runs away from these topics or makes fun of them because it's, it's way beyond their capability to even attempt to figure out. Right, right. You know, we talked a little bit about oral traditions. Can you tell us about any oral traditions that describe these areas or what they were used for as portals or as technology? Well, actually, there's there's one location which is called the Cori Cancha, which is in the center of Cusco, which was the capital of the Inca. And it's the precision of its construction is absolutely astonishing. You can't fit a human hair in the joints between the stones. It's that precise. Hmm. So the, the Inca, you know, of course it said the Inca built this and they made it their holy of holies, but there's no way the Inca, Inca could have built that structure because they were a Bronze Age technology and the stone that was utilized is basalt, which is very hard. And the quarry is something like 45 kilometers away. And you're, you're looking at millions, millions of pounds of stone. Hmm. So I, I think what happened is that because they were a spiritual people, they were able to pick up that when they were in the center of the Cori Cancha, that the energy was slightly different in that it, it would put them into a slightly alternate state of, of consciousness. And so I think that's why they used it as their holy of holies. But I think originally the power that was um, or energy that was being generated was much, much higher than even when the Inca found it in ruins. That's interesting. 
And some researchers have also pointed out that in ancient cultures, Egypt in particular, there seems to be a much closer connection between their spirituality and technology than there is today, at least on the surface. But have you given any thought to that aspect and how closely those things do seem interrelated in the past? Yeah, I think there was a much more of a whole brain approach in the past. I think that that people, you know, now we're we're hyper specialists in in areas, mm -hmm. whereas I think in the past people of the noble spiritual class were probably disciplined in many different areas and utilized both the left and right brain in, in order to develop a more substantial concept of of consciousness and awareness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems like that might be a slightly better approach to life. But another question I had for you about that path of Veracocha. Apparently, there are several caves there with ancient burial sites and ancient elongated mummified skulls or skeletons. And I'm always interested in caves and deep caverns into the earth. Is there anything else you can tell us about these caves or some of the more intriguing finds from inside them? Yeah, actually, well, caves were used a lot for burial. Especially there's there's a major complex called Oyante Tambo, which is part Inca, part megalithic. The, the the basic thing we know about the Inca is that they discovered when they first entered Cusco in the Sacred Valley, they found ancient sites in ruins as, as if they had been destroyed by some cataclysm. And so they adopted them and made them religious spiritual sites. But a few months ago, my wife and I went to see the last Inca drawbridge, which is made out of natural rope. There used to be hundreds of them, but now there's only one left. And on the way back from there, because our taxi driver was local and quite informed about the ancient cultures, he took us to the opening of a tunnel that we went into about three or four hundred yards. But unfortunately, we didn't bring decent flashlights with us because this whole thing was a surprise, but he insisted that it continued on for six kilometers and that there was a big lake at the end of it, deep in inside the bedrock. Wow. <laughs> that is right up my alley. I love to hear stories like that. Underground lakes, um, lore of underground civilizations. I mean, there are quite a bit of ant farm-like tunnels carved all under the underground, I guess not necessarily carved. I guess some are natural, but there are some that seem artificial all around the globe. Yeah, and there are lots of stories in Cusco from old people that there's a whole underground system of tunnels under, like underneath Cusco, which is super ancient. And a French team did some mapping with a helicopter, I think it was, of using ground penetrating radar. And they found that there's a tunnel that connects an, an ancient site called Sacsayhuaman to the Cori Cancha that I just spoke of in Cusco. So that's a, at least uh, one and a half kilometers or a mile long. Gosh, <laughs> it's so impressive. And it's so odd because you would think that it'd be easier to travel between these places along the surface rather than cutting a huge underground tunnel or if it's natural building sites above a, na a tunnel so that you could g travel between them. I guess, might the suggestion be that the environment was different at that time, or would there be some reason why they would travel underground rather than on the surface? Well, it's hard to really know at this point. The entrance to the tunnel has been blocked at both ends by the government because people kept going in and, and disappearing or <laughs> whatever. <I'm>, but... <laughs> That should be people's right to disappear. It, yeah, well, it should be. You should be able to, to, to risk it if you want to. So it's, it's unknown whether that tunnel is natural or not, or, or whether it you know, was manufactured or not. But I do know that there is a huge system of tunnels in the Giza Plateau area of Egypt, because I've, I've been underground to the third level. Right. And that, that was only possible through a local guide who was able to, you know, get permission to be able to do that. But he said there are probably at least another 10 levels of tunnels that go deeper and deeper. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting. I That was one of the books that I was able to read of yours. Thanks for sharing those with me. And you also indicate that something about the way the Giza Plateau's underground tunnels are carved suggests that 
the Sphinx would be a lot older than the Great Pyramid, or it helps to kind of coordinate which came first. Is that right? Yeah, it, it's likely that the, the Sphinx was first. And the tunnel system we're talking about, they're not carved into sand. They're carved into the bedrock, which is limestone. So it, it is quite possible that the Giza Plateau itself underground connects with other locations like Karnak and also the Valley of the Kings and Valley of the Queens, because even though the pharaohs buried their dead in this, you know, a vast system of tunnels in the Valley of Kings and Valley of the Queens, it's hardly likely that they actually made the tunnels themselves. It's, it's more likely that they discovered them. Right. Yeah, you say in the book, they were just using what they had. And I think that makes perfect sense. Yeah. And also, if, if you go to the Valley of the Kings and you walk down in one of these tunnels, you see the precision of the cutting and the fact that it would be basically impossible for Bronze Age Egyptian workers to be able to carve these tunnels, which are hundreds upon hundreds of feet long and easily tall enough to be able to walk through. Mm -hmm. And as for the tunnels, is it that they connect most of the major sites on the plateau except for the Sphinx? Is that why we think it, it kind of gives us clues about the timing? Well, the, uh, actually, the tunnels go underneath the Sphinx. It's more the weathering of the Sphinx that has has created quite a stir. It was Dr. Robert Schock, who's an uh, American geologist, and when he first saw the Sphinx, he noticed that there were vertical weathering lines and so, of course, the Egyptologists say, well, it's 5,000 years old and, you know, we get, we get sandstorms and the, the sand would have eroded the surface. But when he looked at the vertical lines, he said that could only be done by rain. And we're talking a lot of rain. And so by looking at climate models, he was able to figure out that the last time substantial rain occurred in the Giza Plateau area was at least 10 to 12,000 years ago which is twice the age of the dynastic uh, Egyptian civilization. Hmm. Yeah, I, I love that. It does seem to be pretty good evidence. So I also wanted to jump to some kind of weird stuff that I, I've seen from you on your website and in pictures. One of them would be this uh, amphibian humanoid bean skull that was found in a cave labyrinth in Peru. Apparently it wasn't the only one, but it has to be one of the most interesting heads I've ever seen. Yeah, that's. Uh, I kind of hesitated to even show it because <laughs> it is it is so bizarre. I was sent when we were in Cusco about two and a half months ago. I was sent photographs of that little skull, and and of course it looked like it was fake or ma made out of paper mache or something like that. But the man who has it contacted me and said, "Would you like to?" Or I I said, "Can I see it?" And when we actually went to see it, you can tell that it was once some kind of life form. My training is in biology. Also, good for them, they took it and also this very large three-fingered hand to be x-rayed in Cusco at a hospital. And the, the radiologist who both took the x-rays and examined these artifacts said, yeah, I think these are, you know, these were once life forms of some kind. I don't know what, but... <laughs> They don't seem to be fake. And he, he kept insisting these are not fake. These, you know, this is bone. This is skin. What it is, I don't know. Yeah, and I love that three-fingered hand as well. It's got fingers that are much longer than ours. At first, I thought it was the bones of some type of fin without the blubber on it. But that theory was tossed out the window when you zoom in on the fingernails. And that's a little creepy, but it is clearly a hand of some kind. Yeah, it you know, the elongated skulls are one thing, but these I was in complete shock with. Hmm. And we happen to have two local native healers slash shamans with us looking at them. And I guess the difference between North America and, and Europe in terms of mentality is that native people tend to be, I guess, a little more open-minded. And when I said, what do you think these are? They just looked and said, well, they look alien. <laughs> Aliens and UFOs are, are very much accepted in places like Mexico and Peru. Yeah, I've heard that because they apparently see them so often, it isn't really a big deal. So, yeah, that mummified amphibian humanoid, it looks like a frogman's head or something, but uh, apparently, yeah, from the x-rays, it shows that there are sinus cavities in it. There's 
plenty of indications that it is, was a real thing. Can you tell us about anything else? Was this um, three-fingered hand found near the frog skull? Again, it's, it's, uh, it's not based on me visiting the actual location because that's, that's, it's very controversial at, at the moment. But the basic story we were given was that these two specimens are from either a cave or a labyrinth in the Nazca area of Peru, which is just south of me here. And they were found in a large stone sarcophagus containing numerous other body parts of, of odd-looking beings. And that the white material that's on the surface is actually the clay of the area. It's what the ground is made of. So they, they could have been sitting in this stone box for hundreds, if, if not thousands of years. I keep making inquiries as to going to see the location, but unfortunately what's happening is the people who control the site and area are selling these odd artifacts off, I guess, to foreigners. Mm. And so they don't want anyone there because if, if the government finds out where this location is, they will immediately move in and grab it as an, as an ancient historical site. Mm -hmm. So these people are supposedly quite armed and dangerous. But I, I am still trying to negotiate to try to go, you know, even if they have to blindfold me or something. <laughs> I'd, I'd, just, I'd, I'd like to see if there is more to this. But the two people who, who are acquainted with these objects, they're very honest people. They, they don't want to make money from this. They're just curious like we are as to what these things are. And hopefully DNA testing will be done and radiocarbon to see how old they are. Yeah, absolutely. I would love to know more about them. But yeah, unfortunately, it just is what it is right now. But you know, studying oral traditions as you have, is there anything in the area in terms of oral stories or traditions that could tie into these findings? There are so many stories, as you mentioned, about people having sightings, mainly of glowing orbs or you know, flying saucers or discs, etc. It's widely accepted that off-planetary beings have been visiting this area, especially around Lake Titicaca and Nazca for thousands of years. And so local people don't understand our fascination because they've heard from their parents and grandparents and great-grandparents about contact or sites or visitations and things like that. I love it. It's such a different type of way to handle things than the way we do over here. It's just, it's fun to hear about how different it is. To switch gears slightly, I, of course, I couldn't read all your books, but I did read a couple, and I really liked Crimson Horizon in particular, where you talk about the mysteries of Easter Island, which is kind of in the neighborhood of these areas we're discussing. What do you find most intriguing about Easter Island, and can it really be tied back to these areas in Peru? Very much so. It's all part of, of looking at the migration pattern and ancient migration patterns of people, because it's quite likely that the Paracas, for example, did not originate on the coast of Peru. They, they could have come from somewhere farther to the west. And what makes Easter Island pivotal is that it would be, for maritime people or travelers, it would be a perfect stopping place if you were going east or west, because its ancient name literally means the land of flowing water or weeping waters, because there are giant caverns inside the island which are storehouses of, of water due to its volcanic nature. There are also ancient oral traditions that when the first people who were there, pre-Polynesian, that there were blonde and red-haired people with light skin of quite tall stature who the Polynesians first encountered probably 2,000 years ago. And even when Van Rogoveen, who was the first European to land there, and he's the one who called it Easter Island, he noted in his ship's log that he saw people who were of dark complexion, light complexion, black hair, red hair, blonde hair, tall and short. Hmm. A multicultural center of sorts, it seems. <laughs> yeah, well, very much a, a crossroads. Yeah. And... Another element that was interesting, what about this Rongo Rungo tablet? Apparently, no other Polynesian culture had a hieroglyphic system, but this seems to be something in that neighborhood, right? Very much so. No other Polynesian, you know, po the Polynesian cultures have not even hieroglyphs, but they have petroglyphs, and they tend to be quite simple. Like, you'll see a stick figure of a person or a dog or the symbol of a sun, something like that. But the Rongo Rongo text, unfortunately, most of them were destroyed by the missionaries 
because they were thought to be taboo and they, they were carved on wooden boards so they'd be easy to burn. But the probable story behind that is that it's likely that the Rongo Rongo existed with this pre-Polynesian culture and that it was their system of language. And there is the possibility that that system of symbols originated somewhere in the Indus Valley. Hmm. I guess when it's compared to things around the world, can it be read or decoded to any degree? No, but the, the one code system that it looks most similar to is an ancient code from the Indus Valley of the India area. Mm. Man, so many mysteries. And I love also the idea of lost continents, which you get into a little bit in Crimson Horizon, where you say that speculation and controversy are ripe with the thought that a continent once existed in the Pacific Ocean in the distant past, and that the people who presently live on the islands we have already discussed, as well as Peru, are descendants of such a sunken realm. And you go on to say that most common names for this sunken continent are Lumeria and Mu, Based on what little we know, are these descriptions close enough to suggest we have two titles for this for the same place, or are the stories different enough to suggest two separate places? I think it's more likely that Mu is the original name. I think Lemuria was made up in the 18th century. So there is a Hawaiian oral tradition that says that before the Tahitian people, who were the ancestors of most of the Hawaiians, arrived in Hawaii, that there were people living there again. <laughs> and, and, and you get the same story in New Zealand. Again, we have these red-headed people with very light skin. Hmm. And there are still people who live in Hawaii that have this genetic dark red hair. It's called ehu, which means red-haired. Interesting. Come, it keeps coming up. And maybe this means nothing, but it is kind of interesting that phonetically you have Mu right in the middle of Lumeria. Yeah. <laughs> maybe it means nothing. Well, in, in one of my latest books, which is called Aftershock, and that's about the ancient cataclysm that I think destroyed all of the megalithic societies mm -hmm. about 12,000 years ago. And this is based on science, which is collecting more data. And that's at the end of the last ice age was 12,000 years ago. And it, it was not a gradual process. It was very traumatic and rapid. And even, again, Dr. Robert Schock believes that the rising of the sea level, which was more than 300 feet at the end of the ice age, could have taken as little as two weeks. And so that would have been the disappearance of these so-called lost continents rather than Atlantis or Mu sinking into the ocean. It was the rising of the sea level that buried the land masses, forcing survivors to flee, to rebuild their societies in other locations. Mm -hmm. I think that makes perfect sense. And as for what we hear about uh, Lumeria or Lumerian lore, in the book you say that one of the most elaborate accounts of lost continents was given by the theosophical author William Scott Elliot, a name I'm not familiar with, but what did he have to say about it? Honestly, I don't remember. God, that goes way, way, too, <laughs> way too back in time. I don't remember. But I do know that the Theosophical Society were a 19th century group of thinkers who were collectors of ancient esoteric knowledge. So they, they were very big on subjects like Atlantis, uh, as well as Mu or L Lemuria, and What's happened to their information, I honestly don't know. Fair enough. There are a lot of names for sure. And just on the subject, one more thing. Apparently, as far as Moo's concerned, it being a lost Pacific Ocean continent, it was popularized by a guy named James Churchward. Uh, you relay his story saying that Churchward claimed that while he was a soldier in India, he befriended a high-ranking temple priest who showed him a set of ancient clay tablets, supposedly in a long-lost Naga Maya language, which only two other people in India could read. Having mastered the language himself, Churchward found out that they originated from, quote, the place where man first appeared called Mu. <laughs> Gotta love it, man. Very provocative. Uh, I guess, is there anything else noteworthy? Any? I mean, obviously, you know, we're, we're grasping at threads when it comes to a lost continent, but is there anything else in your studies that you found interesting about that idea of a lost continent in the Pacific? Yeah. Churchward wrote, I think, four or five books. 
And of course, he was laughed at at the time by academics, but he, he did a lot of on the ground investigations. And that's where he was able to develop these possible connections between the ancestors of the Maya and areas of India, Tibet, and maybe Nepal. Again, that's, that's where, you know, we were just discussing the whole idea about the Rongo Rongo language may have come from the Indus Valley area. And that, that tells us that people were traveling, utilizing the Pacific and Indian oceans a lot in the distant past. I think what's curious is I lived on Maui for two years, being involved in a cultural project there. And when we looked at a topographical map, because the people I was working with there were all kind of studying the same topic, more or less based on Graham Hancock's work, we noted that if you lowered the sea level of the Pacific by 300 feet, basically all of the islands of Hawaii would have been connected. So I honestly believe that Mu or Lemuria was Hawaii. Wow. Fascinating, man. Uh, another interesting piece of info that you have in the book as it relates to the possibility of radical change in the past is you say that according to one theory, Madagascar and India were indeed once part of the same land mass, thus accounting for their geological resemblances. But plate movement caused India to break away millions of years ago and move to its present location, colliding with the Asian mainland and forming the Himalaya Mountains, which are supposedly still growing vertically to this day. And man, that's cool. How about that? Yeah, and actually it's the same with the Andes here. The Andes are still growing because you have the Pacific Plate and the Nazca Plate that are grinding against each other. And that's also why, of course, it's, um, it's quite a volcanic earthquake prone area because once in a while one of the plates will slip and hopefully not in the, in the near future create a, quite a massive earthquake because this, this is part of the so-called ring of fire. Mm. And, um, of course, talking about those kind of things, that's a time depth of millions of years ago, apparently. So it doesn't really have much to do with the people we're talking about. But as far as a cataclysm roughly ten to 12,000 years ago, of course, we hear guys like Graham Hancock and Randall Carlson talking about a meteor impact that would have hit the huge ice sheets during this period to cause massive flooding. But you seem to be more in the camp that it could have been some type of plasma burst, that that would be more likely. Is that right? Yeah, the reason why I wrote my book, Aftershock, is because there are so many different theories. But the interesting thing is the timeline is almost always the same. It's always about 12,000 years ago. So I looked at all of the research I could, and... I think what happened, there, there's one theory that it was plasma ejection from the sun, and that's Robert Schock's theory. Another theory is comet or comet part impact or, or close flyby, which would be more of the Graham Hancock idea. There's also Paul Laviolette, who's an American physicist, and he believes that actually galactic center is not a black hole, but is a pulsar, and that once every approximately 13,000 years, it erupts with energy. And so that energy would cross the galactic plane. And so I think all of these theories can be put together. I believe Paul Laviolette's idea that there is this, this eruption that happens from galactic center about every 13,000 years. And so that wave of energy, of cosmic energy and gamma rays and things like that, could have grabbed things like comets in their path, could have gone straight through the sun and caused solar plasma bursts on the other side. So I, I think it was a system of all of these events, and it could have been something that wasn't a, a one-time thing, but could have taken place over the course of two or three hundred years. Right. I mean, that throws another wrench in things that it doesn't even have to be one particular method of destruction. But as debated a topic is that is, you're right. A lot of researchers are focusing on that younger Dryas period, that 10 to 12,000 years ago this window of time. And I guess a picture does start to emerge when you think about global flood myths, rising waters around that time, destroying the high societies of their day and uh, resulting in the megaliths that we find now. I mean, there is a bit of a clarity to that narrative when you really put all the pieces together, wouldn't you say? 
Yeah, definitely. And another thing to consider is there are ancient oral traditions that talk about a time when there were only two seasons, not four. And so if you look at our planet, which is presently at a, a tilt of 23 and a half degrees, which doesn't seem to be something the universe would create. You'd think everything would be in perfect harmony. Then when you also find the asteroid belt was likely a planet, uh, you have the planet of Uranus lying on its side, and I think Venus is rotating backwards. That could very well be evidence of an ancient series of cataclysms coming from outside or, or possibly inside of our solar system. So if our planet was originally perfectly vertical, that's where we learn the stories of woolly mammoths being found flash frozen in Siberia with food still in their mouths. And it could very well be that this cataclysmic event hit the Earth so hard that it caused this 23 and a half degree shift. And that would be so destructive because almost instantaneously you would have temperate places becoming Arctic, Arctic becoming temperate, tropical becoming temperate. And there is some interest now in, in Antarctica. There's a lot of scientific research going on down there. And there are theories that Antarctica is obviously a landmass, but 12,000 years ago, it probably, or at least parts of it, would have been in a temperate climate. So there are some researchers that think that Atlantis actually is Antarctica. Mm. So we're getting kind of near the end of the road here. I wanted to come back to the Paracas skulls a bit. They're such a big piece of your work. You're so knowledgeable about them. And apparently there has been some DNA testing done recently. Can you break down the findings for us commoners on what the major takeaways are from these test results? Sure. It's been an incredibly painful process to do this because there are no ancient DNA testing laboratories in Peru and the top 10, and there only are about 10, that can deal with 2,000-year-old DNA are located in North America and Europe. So trying to get them to do the testing has been very difficult because they tend to be closed shops, like they belong to a university that doesn't take outside samples. Also, if they get a hint of what you're trying to test, just by the shape of the skulls themselves, they'll immediately say, no, we're not interested. So we were fortunate in being able to have a sample tested about three and a half years ago in the United States. And the geneticist was perplexed because what happens when you, when you DNA test a sample from a human being is that that sample is compared with every other known human sample and that's contained in a giant database called Gentech. So that's why somebody in modern times can have a, a swab taken from inside their mouth or a blood sample. And they can find out very rapidly, you know, that they're, you know, Scotch Irish or 75% Scotch Irish or 85% of European ancestry with a curious bit of Chinese throw in, thrown in. I, I, I think pe people like to have their DNA tested in order to be able to, to see how interesting their background is. Yeah. But, but when it comes to ancient DNA testing, it requires the most sophisticated next generation sequencing. And so um, we had one sample taken and he wrote back and said, this is very strange because there are segments of this DNA that don't match anything human or ape or mammal or anything I can find. And that caused a worldwide shock. The unfortunate thing was he was immediately fired because he was doing this testing without the permission of the owners of the laboratory. Mm. But fortunately, we've been able to bring him online because we were able to get samples tested from a, a, a private collection from Peru and only from four skulls. But the results indicated that the an ancestry is either Euro Northern European or Middle Eastern. So that doesn't fit in with the Bering Land Bridge hypothesis that all Native Americans walked across the Bering Land Bridge 12,000 years ago. So that's, that's interesting, but we've been negotiating with the government here and one of their departments specifically for 25 months in order to be able to have samples from one of the official museums tested. And I am hoping and praying that we are within day, like literally days of being able to have that done. Wow. And so 
based on your alternative ideas to the mainstream, were you surprised or are those kind of the results that uh, you kind of expected? Well, I, of course, I, I just go with what the data tells me. And uh, the fact that the red hair was, was in existence indicated to me that obviously there was something going on, that these people had come from somewhere other than the local area. They were probably great seafarers. And so that's why the Middle Eastern results I found to be really interesting. Again, the, the Northern European part could be that those people were descended from people from the Middle East. There would be no alien DNA detectable because as far as I know, GenBank does not have any alien D DNA to compare it with. <laughs> but, but what we're simply hoping or, yeah, hoping is that these 15 new samples will be very similar to the four that we've already had tested. And if that's the case, then that builds a strong story of a migration of an ancient people that nobody cares about except me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that will be exciting to get those results too and see if it just adds more fuel to the fire or if it takes us in a totally different direction. Right. Hmm. And I'm also curious, it does seem like a lot, a lot of uh, museums seem to be kind of removing these elongated skulls from view as they get more attention, but are there places left where a regular person can go in and see skulls like this on display, or have they all been taken down to the basement at this point? No, actually, the Eka Museum, which is about an hour's drive from here, has the largest elongated skull I think ever found or that I've ever seen. And it's been on display for 40 or 50 years. Nice. They have a collection of at least 100 in the back room, which I've seen. <laughs> Then you have the Lima Museum, which is the National Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology. They have, a, I think, seven on display, but likely 500 to 1,000 in the back room. And then our, our little Paracas Museum here has 45 elongated skulls. And when people come and visit, they're allowed not only to look at them, but take photographs and video. Wow. I guess I would ask, because we know that there was some cradle boarding or actually people were forming these skulls versus some that were natural. What kind of ratio are we talking about when it comes to ones that seem natural that you've seen on display? It's about 4%. Right on, right on. Hey, that's something. <laughs> yeah. And, and actually we, oh, sorry, but we found the specific location of where the, where the largest skulls came from. They all came from the same cemetery. So that means they're all likely related. Wow. And I've also heard you say for people who might be thinking, oh, well, because we do have this tradition of people doing this, maybe even in the most extreme cases, they all could fit under that umbrella. It they, it's, can't be that way because, uh, as you pointed out, just changing the shape of the skull wouldn't add volume to it. In a lot of cases, I mean, these skulls are really large and it couldn't be just just manipulated in that fashion because there's just too much material there, right? Yeah, that's true. And if you ask any doctor, they'll say, yeah, you can, you know, with a baby, you can change the shape, but the ge genetics are not going to change. The skull is going to form the volume that it's, that is being dictated by, by the genes. And, you know, unfortunately, because I live here, I'm constantly finding new specimens. And very recently, one was brought to me of a newborn baby from this same ancient uh, cemetery where all the really big skulls came from it's a newborn baby the volume of that skull is minimum twice the size of uh, of the volume of a normal uh, human child it is very odd looking it's got red hair because it's in a private collection we're hoping to have it dna tested along with some others awesome and of course, we also mentioned the other physiological differences. So there's definitely something here. And the Paracas people, I just think they're so interesting. And just to kind of close the door on all that, apparently they were wiped out by the Nazca people, right? Yeah, that's the theory I'm developing because the Nazca, of course, are famous because of the Nazca lines and geoglyphs. But in fact, they only made a certain percentage of them. It was the Paracas people before them that created the 500 tall one called the Candelabro, as well as about 1,500 smaller ones. The Nazca people made about, I think, 25. But the, the Paracas people made 
more than a thousand. Damn. <laughs> Well, the world is definitely not short on mysteries. I'm glad guys like you are out there doing the dirty work to relay all this information to the lazy folks like me. <laughs> Super impressive stuff. And I know you also do tours, which I, for one, am really interested in. I'm sure other people would be as well. Tell us a bit about uh, your tours, what they entail, and the ones you might have coming up for people to be able to join in on. Sure. Well, my wife and I do tours about 25% of the time, which is maximum what we do, because we love to provide a quality experience for people. I, I don't want to be a tour guide, but I, I love to share these locations with, uh, with people. All of them can be found at hiddenincatours.com, which is also a massive database. Only 5% of the website is about tours. The rest is all free information. So we have, uh, it's too late to join the March tour of Egypt, but we have one in Cusco in June about the Inca, another one in August, which focuses on the elongated skulls of Peru. And then we have another one in November, which is with author Robert Boval, who's a good friend of Graham Hancock's and a great author. And then we have another one in Mexico in January of 2018. Beautiful. I would love to take one of those sometimes. I mean, it seems like maybe my best chance to see a natural elongated skull if I'm on the right tour, right? That's right. Hmm. Beautiful. 